Good evening and welcome everyone. I'm Archit Sashadri. You are watching India Prime tonight. All the big national stories that headlined all day till this hour on tonight's show. Pakistan seems to be cracking down on militants. Is this for real? We take a look. Vijay Malia likely to be extradited by Britain. Will the Baron be brought to justice? Also, polls are up in Uttar Pradesh. Enter the home stretch. We leak. We take a look at the fast and furious campaigning efforts. Also, a popular actress from Tamil Nadu film says the casting couch does exist. We find out more. And of course, India's take on Australia in a four-match cricket test series. It's all for the battle for the first number one positions. Those stories shortly on India Prime. But first, we start with Pakistan. It seems that Pakistan is serious about tackling terrorism in its own backyard. This after last week's deadly blasts in a Sufi shrine. It looks like Pakistan has just run out of patience with, quote, snakes in their own backyard. Going after militants and claiming to have killed a hundred of them, canceling licenses of weapons issued to the JUD chief, Hafiz Saeed, as well as calling for a joint terror fight with Afghanistan. Is this for real? What is the message that Pakistan is trying to do? Let's first go to our WEON correspondent, Daniele Pagani, to bring us perspective on this story. Daniele, thank you so much for joining us with regards to this. You know, quite a bit of chaos happening in Pakistan. Let's first talk about, you know, the strategy. You know, ISIS has claimed responsibility, the JUD. Is what Pakistan, is this really trying to crack down on terrorism or is this just a way to uh, perhaps appease India? Daniele, your thoughts. Well, uh, what I can tell you is that uh, we are yet to see. What certainly is one major problem that Pakistan has right now with the streams of attack, we have to remember that from the 21st of January 2017 up to today, there have been five attacks causing more than 120 civilian casualties. So there is a problem. And one major problem will be in the relation that Pakistan has with the United States. The relation between the two states was already a little bit frozen during the Obama administration. And if Pakistan wants the U.S. to keep supporting, they certainly have to show that their intentions are true and realistic when it comes to curb down the terrorists in, within their uh, borders. And Daniele, you know, also with regards to this, there have been, uh, as we talked about, many of these attacks in Pakistan. Can we draw any links, perhaps, uh, uh, to uh, what is happening in Pakistan? You know, even today there was an attack at a court. Uh, last week we saw that deadly blast at that shrine. Are there any parallels when, when it comes to combating terror with the uh, JUD? Uh, of course, uh, Hafiz Syed, the, uh, uh, the mastermind uh, behind the 26th uh, November attacks. But with regards to these recent ones, can we draw any parallels or links or uh, not just yet. It's very difficult to say right now. I would like just to stick to the quantitative aspect of this. As I said, from the 21st of January up to today, which means a month, there have been five major attacks causing more than 120 civilian casualties. Whether there is a parallel, whether there is a strategy behind these coordinated attacks, even if they have been perpetrated by different actors, it's very difficult to know and probably impossible to know. But certainly, it doesn't look like a coincidence because it's a sort of a peak of attacks in the first two months of the years. After, let me tell you, after in 2016, the number of terrorist attacks have decreased actually in Pakistan. And Daniele, you know, in terms of uh, diplomatic relations with other countries, you know, uh, with what is happening in the United States, with that global travel ban that Trump has talked about, uh, you know, of course, we do know that Hafiz Saeed was put on house arrest uh, just a short while back, a few weeks back, in fact. Can we draw and say that Pakistan is basically doing all of this just to sort of show its presence in terms of the global community, how the world views Pakistan? They've uh, got a lot of heat, you know, when it came to SARC last year, when it comes to dealing and combating with terror. We do know that Pakistan was not on that banned list that, you know, Donald Trump put out. It was not one of those seven Muslim countries. But is this just a way that Pakistan perhaps is uh, sort of showing its message to the global community, certainly India, perhaps uh, the United States and uh, other uh, countries that sort of look down at Pakistan and say, maybe Pakistan is changing its course? Or is this all just sort of a, uh, you know, a way to, you know, a, a puppet uh, form of uh, presenting in light, even though really nothing is being done uh, behind closed doors? What do you think? 
Well, uh, again, I have to tell you that it is time, I think, for Pakistan to take a stance, to take a hard stance on this, because for many years Pakistan have been playing the card of the good and the bad terrorists. So right now, in order to gain a new shape, a new credibility in the international uh, theater and to reconnect with the United States, but not only with the United States, with the many possible international partners, what I think is that it is time that the Pakistan government uh, takes a firm decision and start to curb down terrors. Uh, I don't think that these attacks are in any way a reaction to the Trump's uh, foreign policy, also because it's too early. Trump has uh, not done anything yet, anything concrete yet. So, personally, I do right. not think this is a reaction for that. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for that. Now let's go to our other guests joining us on the discussion, including uh, Kamaraga. He is a senior journalist, as well as our Pakistan Bureau Chief, Taha Siddiqui getting us perspective on the story. Let me first start with uh, Kamaraga. Uh, all of this cracking down on terror somehow, uh, is it going to benefit Pakistan or is it going to make India sort of a look at Pakistan in a different light? Uh, will it really help? Your thoughts? You see, uh, it, it, there are, you know, a number of things, you know. It's a message for both, you know, India as well as United States. Pakistan is trying to carve out a new role for itself in war against terror, you know, because uh, the differences between the United States and Pakistan has widened, and Western nations are not happy with the policies uh, persuaded by the Pakistan in the last uh, couple of years, especially, you know. Pakistan is one country which is, in fact, now promoting Chinese interest in the region and um, which is posing serious threat to the American security in the region. Besides this, you know, Hafiz Saeed is basically, you know, he's a warlord. He has a, his own army, you know, this uh, lashkar e taiba you know, which is involved in ma conducting massacres, several massacres, not only in India, but Afghanistan and now Bangladesh also, you know. Right. They have large number of people. They are very well-trained, well-equipped uh, and uh, funded by the Pakistani military establishment, you know. So we'll have to wait and see how serious is Pakistan because... Yes, there are, um, you know, over a dozen militant uh, uh, attacks have taken place in Pakistan in the last one month, you know. But they don't care, you know, because these, uh, Pakistan is using, mili especially, you know, these militants against its own people, especially in, in we have witnessed, we have seen it in, uh, uh, in uh, Baluchistan and in the Sindh where nationalist movement is growing. So sometimes trying to sabotage that movement, you know, allows these militants to conduct these operations, you know. All right, and then, all right. you know, pose as if, you know, the Pakistan is a, uh, uh, is a victim of terrorism, you know. So all sorts of things are happening in that country. But one thing, uh, they have arrested Hafiz Saeed. It's a very positive development and uh, he is being declared as a uh, terrorist. That we should be welcome. And these are some, uh, uh, you know, gestures towards India. I think it looks uh, Pakistan military establishment wants some sort of... Uh, this, uh, I mean, is going to allow uh, peace talks between the two countries, India right. and Pakistan, is, right. uh, is right. trying to, is giving some overtures, you know. We'll some have to sort wait of a, a guideline, some sort of a, you know, a validation, interesting perspective. We'll get back to you in just a moment, but let me go to my colleague, Taha Siddiqui, joining us live in Islamabad. Taha, you know, talk to me about what is this genuine support that is coming out for Hafiz Saeed? Is it actually true in Pakistan, the local sentiments, you're there on the ground, uh, you know, uh, how real is the support uh, for Hafiz Saeed and uh, what areas specifically in Pakistan show that support or do they even show it at all? Well, there is a lot of support that he enjoys, especially amongst the rural population. Uh, and specifically, if you talk about the Punjab province, uh, where we saw, uh, we see a lot of uh, anti-India sentiment or more pro-Kashmiri sentiment. So in Punjab province, he has a lot of presence on the ground. Uh, if you look at uh, how his, his supporters and his, his followers are, are sort of spread across Pakistan, we've seen in the last few years that uh, they have centers uh, which, uh, through his charity wing, the Falai and Sanit Foundation. They have centers all across Pakistan. They have uh, bases in, in, in Karachi, in, in Sindh province, and they have religious seminaries. They have mosques, networks, even to the extent that in Balochistan province, which is considered to be quite remote and, and sort of out of reach for the rest of mainstream Pakistan, 
Uh, we saw that, uh, you know, recently when there was an earthquake in Afghan in Balochistan, uh, Falahi and Sanit Foundation was one of the first ones to actually reach the spot and, and carry out rescue services. So because of that, the Pakistanis consider them uh, consider the Jamaat Dawa as a charity organization, as a humanitarian organization. And in their minds, this whole thing about whether or not it is a militant organization or a terrorist organization, that does not come because that discussion does not really happen openly in Pakistan, on the media, uh, amongst the politicians. There are some Sometimes we see some uh, some politician uh, saying so, but uh, then again, sort of the backlash or or the fact that we see that uh, the the media doesn't really pick it up, self censors on such issues because they know that uh, Jamaat Dawa enjoys a close relationship with the state. Uh, so in that sense, uh, the the Pakistani public uh, considers uh, Jamaat Dawa as a, as a humanitarian organization right. uh, rather than a militant organization. All right, let me go back to my colleague now, Daniele Pagani, who's standing by in the newsroom. Daniele, you know, real quick, you know, you've seen what it's like with ISIS, and you've been on the ground in Mosul. You've dealt with that and how the, the world sort of looks at combating terror. Going back to Pakistan, you know, our, our topic of uh, discussion on India Prime tonight is what is happening in Pakistan. Is this a strategy again? You know, I want to ask this with regards to Hafiz Saeed. You know, we just heard from Taha, who says that that group, the JUD, is viewed as a charitable organization. In India and other places, they want that group to be designated as a terror organization. This news just coming in, you know, a few weeks after his house arrest. Uh, why now? Why is this Pakistan's timing happening now? Or is there something behind their strategy? So again, it's very hard to say. Um, yes, there's a, I think there is definitely a sort of a timing, a sort of a strategy, because uh, we are speaking about five major blasts in five weeks. And uh, this cannot be something that comes out of the blue, that comes without any strategy. Whether this is linked directly with the JUD, we don't know. What we know is that certainly the Islamic State is uh, uh, slowly, slowly gaining terrain in Pakistan. But let me explain you a little bit how it's happening according to the knowledge that we have. It's not a foreign intervention. So some of the minor groups which are not happy with the leadership of the Pakistani Taliban have uh, do do use the name of the Islamic State when they carry out attacks. So it is not that the Islamic State is uh, gaining ground in Pakistan, so is moving out of the Middle East or West Asia, as we might say it from India, and getting to Pakistan. It's just a minor galaxy of small groups which are acting in the name of the Islamic State. Whether there is a coordination and a strategy behind that is very early to say. Really too early, probably. All right, Daniel, thank you so much for your perspective. Let me now go back to Atta uh, with regards to uh, what is happening with Hafiz Saeed, you know, uh, where do we see this moving forward with India and Pakistan's relation going forward? Does India, you know, India, uh, is this going to perhaps improve a little bit of the tension happening between the neighbors? And, uh, uh, you know, do we legitimately consider this that Pakistan's decision is uh, for uh, uh, for real? Or, uh, again, is it just a sort of a, a, a facade that they're, that they're portraying at this point? I know you said they're locally the media, the, the way it's perceived as a charitable organization. But, you know, going forward for the, the relationship between both countries, where do we see this uh, proceeding? Well, uh, if there were actually some concrete actions being taken by Pakistan, we would have seen them. Uh, what we see right now is the fact that there are these measures which a lot of people in Pakistan also have seen in the past, where Hafiz Said was put under house arrest before, uh, then his organization was put on a prescribed list of banned militant organizations, and then they got relief from the high courts and, and different uh, courts in Pakistan because the government did not proceed any further in providing any evidence. Uh, right now, also, when we saw the uh, arrest, house arrest of Hafiz Saeed, right after that, he did a press conference in the presence of police. So he was allowed to do a press conference. In the same way, we've seen these uh, militant activities or these terrorist attacks in the last one week, uh, 10 of them uh, in the last, just one last week, and then today, another one. So in the last 10 days, over 11 attacks. And majority of the time, the response of uh, rescue services, because the government's rescue services are poor, the response actually comes from organizations like Falai and Sanyat Foundation. They were one, one of the first ones to be present after the Lahore blast. They were the ones uh, first ones to be present out, outside the Seven uh, Shrine attack. So they're everywhere. And, and, and the fact that they're 
today only they they held a protest across the country in major parts of the the cities in in different parts of the cities where they were openly uh, preaching hatred uh, towards india right. towards the us so in that sense uh, they are kept oper- they they're quite operational while there are these cosmetic measures in the sense that to tell the international audience that we are doing something but the ground reality is much different all right, let me have you stand by there, Taha. Let me now go back to uh, Kamar again uh, to get some perspective. Uh, Kamar, you know, it's taken a bit of time uh, for Pakistan to go after people like Hafiz Saeed, you know, the house arrest and then this uh, designation coming in. Uh, why is that the case? And uh, what about uh, Masood Azhar as well? You know, he continues to have support in uh, Pakistan. Uh, why this time? And, you know, uh, is this uh, something that we could perhaps read into that this is just uh, perhaps Pakistan's uh, strategy going forward to uh, get some better uh, light on the international diplomatic front. You see, this half-hearted measures will not help solve the problem mm. between the two countries. Uh, we haven't seen any major change or shift in Pakistan's policy towards militancy. Uh, the, the Pakistan continues to support militant groups, you know. Hafiz Saeed, they have arrested earlier also, as mentioned by Siddiqui, and then it was released. This time also, you know, it was, timing is very important because just before the Munich uh, security um, uh, conference, which uh, took place in Germany, and where he has issued this statement of his, declared him as a terrorist, you know. But the problem is, another problem is, you know, the Pakistani court. Pakistan's court is increasingly dominated by the jamaat islami since the time of Ziaul Haq's time continued, you know, the jamaat islami playing a very important role and very, I mean, it's uh, most of the judges we have found, you know, have some sort of lineage uh, towards jamaat islami or they, they are the ones who were uh, nominated to the judgeship, you know. So this is another problem. We should not expect that, he'll, uh, I mean, uh, he, the, the, he would uh, uh, or he would be declared by the judge, by, by the by the Pakistan Supreme Court or Lahore High Court, you know, as a terrorist. You know, they would find enough evidence. They, they, we, India has given them uh, actionable report to uh, 2611, and what has happened in the end? You know, nothing. They didn't find. They said it is not actionable. So these are the right. problems Pakistan is genuinely facing. Second thing, you know, these groups are continue to operate. You know, like Azhar Masood. You know, Azhar Masood is operating there continue to function there. I mean, and China is also backing. There is another problem in the Chinese angle is there. So Pakistan has become more belligerent, you know, ever since it has received uh, the Ch- Chinese support, right, right. you know, Chinese d- dual policy of China towards militancy. So that right. is another major problem, you know, uh, for us, you know, and Dealing we with hope, both you the, know, uh, the neighbors between uh, Pakistan you know, and some China. Since we prevail, you know, and all right. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time for this discussion, but certainly uh, uh, lots to talk about. We appreciate our time for Daniele Pagani, Taha Siddiqui, as well as Kamar joining us on this discussion with regards to Pakistan and terror. Well, moving on to other stories this hour on India Prime. Let's now go to uh, Vijay Malia. In what may come as a blow to liquor baron Vijay Malia, Britain has now assured that the country will extradite Malia. So... Is that good news for India? India and the UK did have some discussions on various topics uh, pertaining to the pending cases with regards to the deportation and extradition. Uh, The Ministry of External Affairs says that uh, it has agreed that central authorities of the both countries uh, would review further progress in these cases every six months through uh, video conferences, all of this at a meeting with their British counterparts under the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty. The Indian agencies sought Malia's custody for his prosecution in a money laundering case against him. At the Enforcement Directorate's instance, the Union Home Ministry forwarded that to the uh, External Affairs Ministry, a request for, quote, transfer Malia from London to India under that treaty. To get more on this story, we're now joined by our correspondent, Sana Khan joining us from the Weon Newsroom. Sana, thanks again for joining us. Uh, you know, let's talk about this, uh, the latest developments with the uh, Vijay Malia scandal, sort of a, an ongoing battle. What's the latest? 
Absolutely. Uh, as you're pointing out, India and UK, they held detailed discussions about several cases that are still pending regards to extradition as well as deportation. And that includes Vijay Malia as well, the, you know, a tainted, embattled liquor baron there. But there has been no formal announcements as of now. But what we are learning from our sources is that India is now adopting a two-pronged approach, which means it, the CBI as well as the Enforcement Directorate are approaching in to bring back Vijay Malia. The ED they're looking at the MLAT or the Mutual Legal Assistance Treaty invoking uh, section or article 111D of MLAT saying that, you know, he needs to be deported back because he is in fact wanted and they need him for questioning in that money laundering case. The CBI looking at extradition, which seems extremely tough at this point, but uh, sources telling us that the UK is now considering India's request, meaning uh, that it is on board but uh, nothing clear as to whether it will actually deport or extradite Vijay Malia. So that is still something which the two governments are still engaging on, whether to extradite him or deport him. But uh, for now, we're hearing that the United Kingdom is largely convinced of India's argument. But then again, nothing is certain. All right, and Sana, you know, can we also uh, speculate, uh, maybe it's a little bit too early, but is this the end of the road for Vijay Malia? Or is there perhaps uh, light at the end of the tunnel? Your thoughts? You know, uh, to put it uh, in perspective, India right now is up a dark alley at this point, meaning this move will eventually, uh, sources telling us, will prove to be largely ineffective because, remember, right now they're discussing about 60 cases which are still pending regarding extradition and deportation. Vijay Malia's case happens to be just one out of those 60 cases. And ever since India and the UK have signed this uh, treaty back in the year 1993, in the time period of 23, 24 years, there has not been one single case of either extradition or deportation as far as India's request is concerned. So keeping in line with that, it seems extremely difficult and unlikely that Vijay Malia is going to be handed back to the Indian authorities. So things not really looking uh, so good for the ED and the CBI as of now. Vijay Malia can, uh, uh, you know, still hope for some time. Remember, there's Lalit Modi. There are a couple of other people like Tiger Hanif, who's wanted in the 1993 blast case. He's still back in London. So chances very, very slim, Archit. All right, Sana, thank you so much for those updates with that story. Moving on now to uh, uh, other big headlines. As far as the polls go in uh, Uttar Pradesh, everybody getting ready for the elections. Uh, well, it's entering now, of course, the last stretch. While the decibel, of course, they've gone up in the campaign. The standards have also, though, gone down with derogatory charges being traded and a no holds barred campaign getting shriller and shriller no party is leaving any of the stones unturned. They are doing whatever they can to make sure they win and get that vote. So quite a, you know, quite a bit of frenzy happening. And of course, we saw that stage collapse as well earlier on, you know, in Allahabad. So certainly it's been an election campaign season that has been, uh, let's, uh, I guess, call it uh, definitely turning a lot of heads. So uh, we'll have to wait and see how all of this unfolds. Let's now go to our chief uh, direct, uh, domestic correspondent, rather, uh, Karthika Sharma, joining us to get his perspective. Karthika, I know you were in Lucknow recently. You've been tracking this. Uh, the, uh, you know, uh, we're sort of getting to that uh, the final home stretch at this point. Uh, bring us up to speed on you know what we can expect in the coming days. Okay. You see, a couple of things are happening. Uh, the sort of discourse which has uh, uh, taken place in Uttar Pradesh, the fight has become very, very personalized. Mayawati, Prime Minister, and Rahul Gandhi have attacked each other up close and personal. Uh, I think the discourse has gone very low, but the fact of the matter is it's a very prestige election and that's the reason why that uh, the whole election has become very, very personalized and that's the reason why the discourse has become so vitiated in Uttar Pradesh, Archit. All right, Karthika, you know, with regards to, uh, you know, in terms of these uh, back and forth jabs and all that, you know, we also saw, uh, you know, this is something that is sort of being closely watched, Uttar Pradesh being such a, a, a very important election, uh, election uh, state. Uh, how important is this for, you know, uh, going forward for some of the other uh, other players who are sort of looking into it? And why do we see this kind of a jab, the name calling back and forth? Okay, let's break it down for everyone. For, uh, Am uh, for Amit Shah, it's about his job. Uh, for Narendra Modi, it's about his prestige. For Akhilesh Yadav, it's about his continuity. For Mayavati, it's about comeback. And for Rahul Gandhi, it is about legitimacy. You know, everyone has everything in Uttar Pradesh. And in, in case they fail to do it, it will serve them very badly in national elections. And that's the reason why Uttar Pradesh has become so important for all these leaders. 
Karthika, you know, uh, just also uh, sort of uh, maybe perhaps uh, putting these things into context, why the, you know, the elections heat up and we see this toward the end of the campaign, how effective is that going to be? Is that really going to transcend with voters at the end of the day? You know, all of this back and forth, will that really win the votes? Will that really change someone's uh, uh, decision on how they decide to uh, cast their ballot? Or is this just more of a for lack of a better word, a stage show to sort of, you know, put on a, you know, this is what we're doing and, uh, you know, sort of a put, put on that, that, that front. Uh, what do you think about that? You know, Archit, from, uh, you, know, uh, you know, if you ask me, I think the important thing here is that the elections in Uttar Pradesh uh, will go on the identity. Elections in Uttar Pradesh will become a matter of referendum for a lot of people. But elections in Uttar Pradesh is also about organizational skill. And for me, what is most important is that elections will ultimately define the way who rules Delhi. And I think that's the most important part. All right, Kartika Sharma, thank you so much for the latest with regards to what's happening with the election. The race still not over just yet. All right, with that note, we're going to take a quick break here on India Prime and continue the conversation on the other side as we dissect some of the big stories here in India and South Asia. Right after this, we take a look at the casting couch in the southern part of India. We'll be right back. Welcome back. This is India Prime. I'm Archit Tashadri. Thanks for staying with us. We continue the analysis of seeing the big headlines across India. And now we move to the southern part of India, where sexual misconduct against women has had a new revelation. Tamil actress Varalakshmi Sarath Kumar shared a personal experience on Twitter. She talked about the programming head of a leading television channel who made unwelcome advances to her during an official meeting. Clearly, it's a trend that refuses to go away as more and more people are seen as soft targets. How important is this in terms of women's empowerment, women's safety? What is the uh, latest being done to a country that is seeing so many instances and incidences of violence against women? To get perspective on this story, we now go to actress Varalakshmi Sarath Kumar, who uh, talked about this. Thanks so much for uh, joining us this evening on India Prime. Uh, first of all, uh, Varalakshmi, talk to me a little bit about the, uh, this trend. Even celebrities at this point are now dealing with this. They're coming face to face and sort of coming out, talking about the, uh, uh, the forbidden casting couch. Uh, you know, bring us up to speed on some of the experiences and things that are tabooed even in the uh, film industry in the South. Uh, see, I think uh, it's because of the conditioning of the mind that we've been experiencing from generation to generation. Having told women that, you know, if anything bad happens to you, the first thing you're supposed to do is keep quiet about it because it might affect your future, uh, you know, your suitor for your marriage or your family life. But then uh, the reason I stood up right now is because we need to make that change. I need to change the mindset of people in general. It's not just one person for in particular. The entire mindset of the country needs to be changed against women. Avara Lakshmi, also we'll talk to you, uh, me a little bit about the, uh, the laws, you know, when it comes to yes. uh, sort of uh, deterring some of these uh, yes. perpetrators and attackers. Is there enough that is being done in, uh, uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't specifically say South India, but just in India right. on the whole? Uh, see, uh, actually, to, uh, in fact, I was reading up on the topic and I was uh, talking to a bunch of lawyers because I was trying to uh, form a revolution and try to do something about it. But the reason is there are enough laws to protect us. But the point is the implementing is where the problem lies. There is no implementation. Because every time we have a case, there are 4,000 cases recorded in Delhi alone, but nothing has ever gone to court because there's too much happening and they actually do, uh, they give second priority to uh, sexual harassment cases, which is why I'm fighting for it. I said we have to have a speedy process of implementing the laws. All right, Varlash, we're going to come back to you in just a moment and also going to uh, get perspective on uh, actress uh, Kushbu Sundar, uh, who is a big film star in the southern part of India. Kushbu, uh, thank you so much for uh, sharing your thoughts. Uh, we're just asking, you know, getting perspective when it comes to the film industry, the whole casting couch, uh, it's not just Hollywood or Tollywood or Mollywood, Bollywood. We hear about it all the time. And then we see these cases that recently what happened uh, with, the, with uh, an actress in uh, Kerala uh, not too long ago. I mean, is enough being done at this point, do you think, uh, to help uh, women, not just in the workplace, but even in the uh, film fraternity? What do you think? Yes. In fact, I was just uh, speaking to someone else and I said that I haven't faced luckily something like this in my 30 years of my career down south. I've never faced something like this. It's very sad in today's world when we talk about such a progressive world. You know, these kind of things do exist when you when you hear people like Varalakshmi Sharat Kumar and others speaking about it, that even they have been subjected to these kind of exploitations. 
It's very surprising. But I think it's high time, you know, anybody who's subjected to this kind of an abuse or exploitation, uh, it's very important that you come out and you speak about them. And it's very important that you name them because, you know, only then will people will be quite uh, scared because they feel that nobody's going to talk about them, there's not going to be any uh, halaboo about it, and nobody's going to file cases against them. I'm very happy and I really, really applaud this actor down Kerala who despite knowing that people know her, she is famous, they know her name, she has gone ahead and filed rape charges against the men who were with her in the, in the car and who have really exploited her. Uh, Kishmo, you know, with regards to that, to though, uh, uh, with regards to that, you, you you brought up a good point uh, with regards to, you know, she 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 made it uh, public, she uh, reported it, she filed a case, and unfortunately, uh, a lot of the times, perhaps because the way society or the way, uh, uh, you know, things are handled, whether it's police or authorities, uh, people are often too scared, you know, if they're perhaps not in that, uh, the, the, that access to uh, being uh, perhaps a celebrity or an access uh, to be in power to report things like this. You know, we've certainly seen the headlines like what happened in Delhi, the Delhi rape cases, what happened in Bengaluru not too long ago. I mean, it's very interesting that many celebrities do come out and they talk about that and raise awareness, but then does that just disappear after a point? You know, th this has happened and then sort of gets the media attention for those today, short time and vanishes. Today we are having a discussion. Today we are having so much of discussion on a national level. Every debate is about this. It's because there are two celebrities involved. That's the only reason. Who's, who's talking, who's debating about a three-year girl who was raped and murdered in Tamil Nadu? Just two days back, who was debating on that? Who was debating about what happened in Bangalore, about the molestation, mass molestation during New Year's Eve? It's, it's a forgotten story. Who's talking about whatever happens in everyday newspaper, you talk about a molestation or a rape? Who's talking about it? Nobody is talking about it because that's not a sensational news. Because there's an actor involved here and there's another actor who's spoken about these kind of, uh, uh, you, you, know, you know, casting couch existing in the film industry, we are discussing about it. Right. This is not about an actor. This is not about a celebrity. It's about a woman. It's about the rights of a woman. It's about the dignity of a woman that has been exploited. And the reason why a girl does not want to come forward is because she feels that it's not only once, but every time she has to face the laws, she will be raped and exploited time and again, right. asking very, very weird questions. So she thinks that it's better she stays mum and she did not talk about it because she doesn't want to face this again and again and again. All right, uh, let me go back to Avar Lakshmi at this point. And, uh, see, you know, how many cases we see, they come on fast track and they have been solved and none. I just heard one of the uh, panels here who was talking about there are 4,000 cases and it doesn't even see the day of the night. Absolutely. We're going to put you on hold just for a second, Kushpa. Let me bring back Varalakshmi to the conversation. Uh, Varalakshmi, you yes. took to Twitter to talk about a situation not too long ago about uh, uh, the casting couch uh, with uh, uh, regards to uh, somebody higher up at a television channel. Uh, you sort of brought that, uh, you know, out and about. You know, it's, it's one of those things that people don't, uh, perhaps they know it exists, perhaps they know it, it, you know, it's part of the industry, but uh, maybe not everybody deals with it, but certainly a lot of people do deal with it. And yes. whether it's uh, considered molestation or sexual yes. abuse or whatever, it's, uh, it's it's being dubbed as bringing those lights to issue. So I'm going to sort of open the floor to both of you, both Varlakshmi and Kushbu, to perhaps, uh, yeah. you know, start a dialogue with regards to uh, how important it is, not just for celebrities or women, but people across so, India and around the, the globe with regards to, to this. The reason, the reason I tweeted about it or the reason I put it up on Facebook is only for the sole reason that it's not, it's in fact, I, in fact, uh, accept the fact that it has, because of the celebrities being spoken about. But the reason I'm trying to fight for is not against just one, that one man. My point is we have to ha stand up for the voiceless. There are so many women in fear, fear of themselves, fear of society, fear of men, fear of the consequences that might happen to them. That's exactly why I have tweeted and Facebook saying, you, it's time to stand up for ourselves because if we don't do it for ourselves, no one else is going to do it for us. What is the response you've gotten? Have you gotten any uh, good, positive, perhaps trolls? What type of feedback have you gotten in with fact, regards to In that? fact, the response has been uh, tremendous because initially when I thought about putting it up, I knew I was going to get some heat for it. But surprisingly, there's not been a single negative comment on my Twitter page or my Facebook page. There are so many women that identify with the whole situation and so many women have come up to my support. So it's amazing to see how many women are actually going through this, but nobody's ever ha uh, been able to speak up about it or do something about it. 
Uh, Kushbu, let me go back to you regarding this. You know, the fact that now actors and even everybody has access to Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, these social media platforms to sort of air out concerns, grievances perhaps, uh, things like this captured on pictures or videos and it can go viral, especially if there's a, a big star that sort of talks about an issue uh, with regards to women's safety or any kind of social issue. How important is that? And do you think that that really resonates? Uh, does that reach the right audience? And, uh, you know, uh, your thoughts with regards to uh, social media is uh, perhaps uh, reach uh, with issues, especially like women's safety? Yes, I think uh, the kind of reach social media has is a platform which gives you the freedom to speak your mind. So, you know, we use these kind of social platforms, whether it is a Facebook or Twitter or any other social network you talk about. The kind of platform it gives you to connect to the people. And like Varalakshmi very rightly said, there are so many of them who probably are going through this kind of and facing these problems in their in their careers. It's not about firms in every sphere of uh, every sphere of life, every walk of life. There are women who are faced with these kind of situations. So for them, they immediately consider themselves. They, they feel that this is the point to speak. And it's, this is just the beginning because what Varalakshmi has done. This is just the beginning and the kind of support she's going to get on this because there are so many women who feel that she's just opened up the dam and that's going to be, you know, a huge thing where women are going to come forward and say that, yes, we went through it and we just needed somebody to speak about it so that we can also talk about it. So there are a lot of women who are going to come out and speak about it and they're going to talk about how, uh, you know, they have been subjected to this kind of an exploitation. But I would really appreciate that if girls from now onwards do not talk about this after it's over. Learn to say no. That's what is very important. We see many girls who come to, uh, to, to, to these kind of pressures under any pro problem. She has a financial problem or she, she definitely needs a job or anything. And that is the time when people try to exploit them because they understand the vulner uh, vulnerability of, of a woman at that particular point and that's how they try to exploit them. So the women have to understand and say no to it. You know, Kushbu, uh, you know, staying with you real quick with regards to that very interesting point that you made about saying no and really standing up and basically putting your foot down if you are in one of those situations, perhaps a compromising situation, whether it's trying to get a job, move ahead, perhaps a, a role in the film industry. Uh, last year, uh, there was a movie called Pink. Uh, Amitabh Bachchan acted in a movie called Pink that had a social message about how women and the role, uh, how women sometimes are sometimes unfairly uh, portrayed or dealt with. And uh, that movie was uh, open to rave reviews. I'm not sure if you or... Uh, if you got a chance to see that. But in terms of India's film industry, could that also be a, a, a factor? Could that be a way to sort of educate the masses? Are, are there enough films in uh, you know, Tamil Nadu, in southern India, that also portray roles like this to perhaps, so, so women are not just uh, you know, item numbers? Are there enough roles given where, even uh, from a sense of society, that women are given more media roles? And that sends out a broader message, just like the way Pink did to, uh, to Bollywood. No, I don't think yes. we, uh, uh, people down south, especially Tamil or Telugu, we are still ready to make those kind of films because the, the medium is very small. And uh, it, it's a very different medium altogether when you talk about films. Uh, I have seen Pink and I really appreciate it because it was a very hard-hitting film. And I think it was brilliantly made with uh, some fantabulous performances by the uh, co-stars co in the film. But I, I think, you know, those it's, people watch the film and then they forget about it. This is the reality. What Varalakshmi has spoken, this is reality. We didn't see anyone speaking about it uh, after the pink was released, anybody coming out and talking that, yes, I was exploited in a similar manner. Nobody spoke about it. But today people are going to come forward and talk about it because Varalakshmi has spoken. Today people are going to come forward and talk about it is because this actor from Kerala has shown courage and has opened the floodgates for women to stand up and say that, so what if I was sexually exploited? Let this be the last time that men cannot get away with it. So I think, you know, these two women have had the courage to speak and they are opening the floodgates. Movie, it's nice, it's brilliant, fantastic, you watch it, it's going to win a few awards and then people are going to forget about it. But the reality is this, what Varalakshmi and this actor from uh, Kerala All right, let me go to Varalakshmi. Uh, thank you, Kushbu. We'll come back to you in a minute. Uh, uh, Varalakshmi, you know, uh, rave reviews there by uh, one of your colleagues, Kushbu, talking about how it is important for uh, uh, not just uh, celebrities, but anybody to come out, speak, put your foot down, yeah. say no. You know, we talked about that movie, Ooh. Pink. Do you feel and like perhaps uh, more could be done with regards like, to that, perhaps uh, in the southern like industry? Like Kushbu said, at the end of the day, it's a movie. People watch it, they right. applaud it, and they come back home and they forget about it. 
so you need to get get to the next step. The point is that you have to make that stand. And like she said, the reason I stood up for this is because I said no. There are a lot of women that go through the same thing who are, who are not in a position to say no. So that's when the you know the deed happens or the exploitation happens. That needs to be stopped. In order to do that, the law has to be a little more uh, severe. In order to do that, the implementing has to be a little more severe. There's a lot of change that has to be that has to happen throughout the society. It's not just one person or one particular state. Or you know, the whole country has to change. Uh, Barlakshmi, you know, going back to you with regards to that, you know, the mindset perhaps of India, you know, is there anything that uh, perhaps we could learn from the West, from other countries perhaps when it comes to situations like this? Or do you think this is something that the is a global phenomenon? Thing, yes, definitely. The first and foremost thing is equality happened very late in India when it comes to women and men. Right. Right. So the thing is, it's a very new concept that's still uh, not yet uh, invaded the thought processes of men up in rural villages or, you know, uh, anywhere else down south or up north, people still think women are inferior to them. That is where the mindset has to change. Right. In order to do that, we need to first instill value systems into uh, our very own women, mothers, who are upbringing, uh, the upbringing of their sons has to change. Interesting point, interesting point with regards to that. Certainly, you know, uh, Indira Gandhi and, you know, we've certainly had the world leaders. Perhaps the U.S. doesn't even have a, a you know, female president yet. But when it comes to yes. dealing with women, a little bit different. But, I mean, what is being done wrong at this point? You, you talked about laws. We've heard about, you know, stricter laws in terms of, you know, protecting women, whether it's the workplace or, you know, things like, you know, sexual exploitation. What, yes. at this point, is the missing piece to the puzzle? There's a lot of missing pieces, that's the truth. Because one of the missing pieces is, first of all, let's not uh, blame others. Let's blame ourselves for bringing up our sons the way we do. If we don't bring them up right, this is what you end up with. Second of all, we have to implement much more severe laws because there are laws, but they're not being implemented. So, for example, a case can go on for two years or one and a half years, and the girl has to keep reliving the same event over and over again without being, uh, without being able to move on with her life. That itself is the biggest mistake, first of all, because it should be in a stipulated time that the conviction happens and they have to be convicted. Uh, Kushpu, let me go back for to you example, again, Kushpu. Uh, sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, no, Radhakmi. Uh, sorry, you know, if, for example, in Saudi, the punishment for rape, I think everybody knows, is get your genital shut off. Right. That is the next step because apparently men in our country don't seem to understand the concept that you can't touch a woman without her permission. That just seems to be a lost cause. So unless the punishment is severe, they're going to think twice about touching another woman. Kushpur, let me go back to you with regards to the same question. You know, uh, uh, we talked about the laws and, you know, we talked about, you know, perhaps are there things that we could learn? Could India perhaps uh, learn some things from the West? Or is this really an issue that's all over the world? It's not just specifically limited to uh, the film fraternity or in India. Uh, what do you think? You've worked, obviously, in the, uh, the, the cinema industry for uh, several decades at this point. Uh, uh, your perspectives? I think we see these kind of problems world over. Um, in India, it's more because we talk about it. Probably others, they don't talk about it. But then when you look at the statics of uh, UN women, I mean, it will show you the kind of women are exploited world over. You know, in any which ways uh, you, you look at it and there's some kind of an abuse or exploitation of a woman. I completely agree with Varalakshmi when she says that, you know, you have to raise your son right. But I would also like to pinpoint that a woman, when she's at home, she has to learn to say no to any kind of exploitation at home. Because many a times we see women, she's subjected to a, some kind of torture at home or given a second citizen, second class citizen uh, status, and she's quite happy with it. Because that is what her son grows up to. Her husband is abusing her, her husband is calling her names, she's been called names by other members of the family. They think that she's the last person or who should be take, taken care of, and she's a second-class citizen, and that is what her son sees she, he, as he grows up, that this is what a woman is about, this is how a woman has to be treated, this is how a woman has to keep quiet in a man talk, this is how a woman has to say yes to every time a decision is taken. She is never part of an important decision-making uh, atmosphere at home. So that atmosphere needs to change at home, and a woman at home has to put her foot down and say, I am equally important. If I can build a family, I can definitely raise a man who knows how to respect a woman. 
So that kind of attitude, which has to be installed in the woman first. Right, you right. You know, the Indian mentality, uh, the minute she is getting married, it's like, oh, this is your home. Now, now onwards, this is what your family is. You have to adjust. You have to compromise. Right. You have to listen to what they have to say and then make sure that you don't, uh, you, you, you actually, you know, protect the names of the family from where you come from. I mean, it's all crap. I, I really wish somebody, when a daughter right. is getting married, they go and tell her, listen, girl, if somebody ill treats you, if somebody does not give you respect, stand up for it, because here we have taught you how to uh, yeah, respect absolutely. yourself and save your dignity. Right, so right. I really want that mentality of Indian attitude to change. All right. Well, thank you so much. We appreciate that insightful discussion with both actresses Kushbu Sundar as well as Varalakshmi Sarath Kumar giving us those perspectives. All right. Now, moving on to other big stories tonight on India Prime. Breaking news coming in from the state of Karnataka. A huge tragedy luckily been averted in the state after a religious event. Take a look at that dramatic video there. Uh, quite a bit of chaos after a uh, the wheels of one of the 60 feet foot high chariots came off during a religious event. This is the Guru uh, Basavashveshwara Ratotsava in Bellari, Karnataka. One of the wheels, again, as you mentioned, about 60 foot high. It was on a chariot, came off. So far, the numbers that we have, six people hurt. Luckily, though, no deaths to report as of this hour. We're now going to our uh, correspondent, Nishita Varandra, who's in Bengaluru to bring us the latest on this breaking story. Nishita, what do we know about this accident? Luckily so far, no deaths, but uh, bring us up to speed. What do we know? Well, uh, this is the Guru Kutureshwara Temple in uh, the Balari district of Karnataka. Actually, and we understand this is an annual event. And uh, during the procession, uh, the chariot came tumbling down, as you can see on your screen. Uh, one of the wheels of the four-wheel chariot uh, came off. Uh, the district officials are still investigating the matter as to why exactly this incident took place since uh, this event has been going on for quite a few years. Now, why uh, proper precaution was not undertaken, it's uh, merely a matter of luck, uh, to say the very least, that uh, uh, the issue has not become more serious than what it is. Uh, six people have been injured. We understand that one of them uh, has been injured fairly seriously. Uh, no casualties have been reported in the incident. Initial reports uh, suggested that a few of the devotees were trapped underneath uh, the chariot that had collapsed. Uh, but uh, we understand that everyone around has managed to escape unscathed except for the six of those uh, devotees who have been injured. And uh, they have been uh, undergoing treatment at the district hospital as well. Uh, the police have also reached the spot to ensure that no confusion prevails. Uh, let's not forget that this is a religious event. You will have large gatherings. You have to avoid a situation where a stampede or any such eventuality could take place. And that is the reason why the police have uh, come in and have controlled the situation. As of now, the matter is under control. And investigations will be launched soon is what the district authorities have told us. Uh, saying that uh, they will be looking into the matter to find out why exactly it took place and whether there was any lapse in security and uh, any, and any precautionary measures uh, taken by uh, the organizers of the event action. All right, Nishita, thank you so much for those updates. Again, breaking news coming in after that religious festival in Karnataka and Balari. Six people hurt so far. Luckily, no deaths. We'll continue to track that story and bring you developments as and when it comes in to our newsroom. All right, now on India Prime, switching gears to sports on a lighter note. The countdown has now begun for one of the biggest test series in the last 12 months. The world's number one test team, India, up against the visiting Aussies, the Australians who are ranked number two in the world. India under Virat Kohli remains unbeaten in 19 test matches and having won eight of their last nine home tests this season. Take a look. They once called Australia's tour of India as the final frontier. The last surviving citadel to the all-conquering Aussie machine crumbled in 2004. But since then, normal service has resumed for the hosts. The last time they toured India, Australia were whitewashed 4-0 in a series more remembered for homework gate than the cricket. Guys are, are really excited about what's what's to come in the next six weeks. Um, you know, it's a great it's a great challenge to play here in India, and you know we, we know that if, if we can pull something off and and win a series here, we'll, we'll look back in you know 10, 20 years, and it'll be some of the best times of our lives. Already, the bravado that characterises any Australian side is very much on display. 
I think each of our individuals play the, the way that they play and you know if they want to get into a, a battle verbally then if that gets the best out of them then go for it um, you know it's all about us making sure that as individuals we're, we're in the, the right mindset to go out and succeed and you know if guys want to get in those kind of battles then then go for it but um, you know it, in the end it's about us playing on skill and making sure that our skills are in the best um, best place for us to, to succeed in these conditions. All right, now let's go get some perspective on this. Of course, we on sports editor Digvijay Singh Dio is in our newsroom joining us. A big battle for the number one position, the Aussies versus the Indians. Uh, how prepared are the Aussies, Dig? Well, you know, Archit, uh, this is one series where they've actually prepared well. They've actually hired Monty Panesar to train uh, them on how to combat the Indian spinners, but that's going to be the big battle. Australia's big batsman against India's spinners, Ravi Ashwin and Ravindra Jadeja. From there, they went to Dubai. They've trained there for the last week or so to get acclimatized as well. So the Australians taking it very, very seriously. But when you look back at history, when you look back at the teams which have come from Australia, let me remind you that Steve Waugh's team could not win in, in India. It was Ricky Ponting's team, which was led by Adam Gilchrist, which conquered the final frontier in 2004. But ever since then, it's been defeat. The last time they were in India, they were whitewashed 4-0. All right, Vic, thank you so much for those updates. Everybody's going to be watching that match for sure, keeping a close eye and cheering on for their favorite team. And unfortunately, that does it for us tonight. That is India Prime. I'm Archit Sashadri. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you again soon. Good night.